from South Carolina Public Radio, this is the South Carolina Lead. I'm your host, Gavin Jackson, and this episode was recorded on November 16th, 2023 from South Carolina Public Radio Studios here in Columbia. You're going to hear that date again because we are taping this in advance because of the Thanksgiving break. But this episode features part of my conversation with Lexington Republican Senator Katrina Sheely. We talk about the JFK Profile and Courage Award that she and the other sister senators won for their stance during the abortion debate. We also have a two-way conversation between South Carolina Public Radio reporters Mayan Schechter and the Russ McKinney on judicial reform that is being debated in the State House. Russ has another piece on the future of the energy industry in South Carolina. And don't worry, Scott Morgan is here. He's looking at a Greenville County ordinance on protesting. I'm not even really hosting this podcast because I'm on vacation, which is not really vacation. But folks, tell us what you're up to. It is Thanksgiving week. Gobble, gobble, gobble. (laughs) If you need a break from your family members or if uh, maybe things got a little too heated during Thanksgiving, give us a shout. 803-563-7169. Unlike your family, we're always here for you. (laughs) It's like Olive Garden up in here. And we won't yell back directly at you. 803-563-7169. Let's start off in the statehouse realm. I want to visit an interview I did recently with Lexington Republican Senator Katrina Sheely. Folks who have listened to this podcast know that she is one of the most vocal opponents to the near total abortion ban bill and the current six-week ban law. She, along with the other four female senators, Republicans Senator Sandy Sin and Penry Gustafson, Democrat Margie Bright Matthews, and Independent Mia McLeod, worked together, along with Democrats and a few Republicans, to block the near total abortion ban bill that was passed by the House. Both of those took place last fall and that killed that special legislative session as well as earlier this year when the bill made it back from the House to the Senate. Now, they couldn't defeat the six-week ban, however, but they were awarded the JFK Profiles and Courage Award, which is for public servants who make courageous decisions without regard to the personal or professional consequences they may bring. I started our interview on This Week in South Carolina with Katrina Sheely by asking her if she viewed her actions as courageous at the time. I don't think I was any more courageous or did anything that I wouldn't have done anyway. I think what we showed more than anything else was how we could work together across party lines. It wasn't so much about the issue as it was the fact that five women from different parties with different views. We don't all feel the same way about that issue. Some of us are more pro-choice than the others. Some think we should have, you know, I introduced a 12-week bill and some want, you know, less time. I mean, you know, more time. You know, they want first trimester 15 weeks. Some want more. We're all pro-life. We all believe in that there should be an opportunity for the you know baby born. Nobody thinks that we should use abortion for birth control. There's none of us that believe that. And we've been pegged with being baby killers and all this stuff. And that's not true. We don't deserve that. But I don't think any of us did anything courageous. We did what we thought was right. But you know, the fact that we received this award is a great honor. And I don't think there's anybody in that chamber, had they been given the opportunity to receive the JFK Profiles and Courage Award would have turned it down for any reason. Now, Senator, the crux of that debate was a near total abortion ban bill that the House passed that uh, y'all helped block in the Senate, along with some other Republicans, some male Republicans. Um, What limit would you support? Where do you see, what would you have supported? I mean, the 12 week, we were at 20 weeks as as a state, and then we got kicked down to six weeks with the current bill that was upheld by the state Supreme Court. Where do you fall in all this? I fall at 12 weeks, and I offered that amendment, and that amendment lost with the 21-23 vote. And I think that if if everybody in that chamber would really step up and and be courageous and vote their real convictions or how they felt when they talked to their, their wives and their daughters, I think we could have won that 12-week, um, the 12-week amendment. 
but people are afraid of the, the next election or what's going to happen. But I think you have to vote your your convictions, what you truly believe. And, you know, women's health care in South Carolina is so we're, we're just at rock bottom. And, you know, how we take care of babies after they're born. It's abysmal. You know, that's the word I used in my speech. We don't take care of children after they're born. We worry more about how women carry the baby in the, you know, before they're born. And I think it's time for men and legislators to let women make health care decisions for themselves. Now, do I think a full term abortion should be allowed? No, I don't. I don't think, a you know, a third trimester, you know, I don't think those are right. Because then by then you should know, you know, what you wanted. But we are being ridiculed for something that I don't even think people understand. And they're taking it out of context. Yeah, I mean, you've been censured by the Lexington County Republican Party. Are you facing any Republican challengers? I mean, y'all are up for re-election next year in 2024. Uh, what's it like between you and the other Republican females, Senator uh, Sandy Sin and Senator Henry Gustafson? Senator Sin already has announced Someone has announced to run against her, and someone has announced to run against uh, Senator Gustafson. Uh, as of yet, no one has announced to run against me. I'm sure there's, you know, someone back there, you know, waiting to come out, and that's fine. You know, everybody deserves the right to run. They should just run for the right reasons. If you look at my record and the things I've done over the last 11 years, I have passed more legislation to help children and families than anybody else has ever passed in that legislature. So they got to run against my record, and my record stands just on its sale. Senator, do you think this is an issue that's a winning issue? I mean, I know different areas have different beliefs and are more conservative in other parts of the state, but, you know, when you hear folks like Congresswoman Nancy Mace from down the low country talking about how this debate needs to shift for Republicans to win, when you see uh, referendums failing in other states, when you see other issues failing related to this, uh, when you hear presidential candidate Nikki Haley talk about a consensus approach versus a 15-week ban, how do you see this debate playing out at the election booth next year? I think that once people get behind that curtain and vote what they really believe, I think that you'll see how it turns out. I think if we would let the people vote on this issue, which, you know, the legislative makeup is not to the point where we're going to let people vote on it, because I think they're afraid of what the outcome would be. It's just like uh, Kansas. You know, you let people vote how they want to vote, and you're going to find out that it's not the way the legislature wanted so I think that when people actually pull that curtain or get over in their little booth or whatever to vote, they're going to find out that what we did was the right thing. Now, everybody doesn't believe that. And I'm not you know, saying everybody believes that because some people truly believe that, you know, a total ban on abortion is the right thing. And, and that's fine. You know, that's your belief. But I believe some people and some people in the legislature are not voting their conviction. They're voting for an election. Staying in this statehouse realm. We are some 60 days away from the start of the second year of the two-year legislative session on January 9th. And one big issue we'll be watching is reforms to the judicial selection and election process in our state. South Carolina, along with Virginia, are the only states in which judges are chosen by the legislature. While this isn't the sexiest of topics, it's very much an important one, and one that will directly impact you. Now, I could go on about this, but Mayon Schechter spoke with the Russ McKinney for more clarity on what's at play here, and they spoke earlier this month. The selection of state court judges by the General Assembly was front and center at the State House this week. A special committee that vets candidates for judgeships began the screening process for candidates which the legislature will elect early next year. At the same time, a special House committee began a review of the process the state uses in selecting judges. Joining me is veteran State House reporter, South Carolina Public Radio's Mayan Schechter. The legislature has started this process amid calls for changes. Will we think we will see any changes this year? 
That's a great question, and I think it still remains to be seen. I would never say never, but when you look at the fact that lawmakers are not in agreement right now about what exactly they want to do, there's so many recommendations and suggestions and ideas that have been floated out there. And then on top of that, next year is the second year of a two-year session, which means any bill that doesn't pass both chambers and get signed by the governor dies for the year because a new legislature will be elected next year. And so it makes it a little bit more difficult to take meteor legislation on such a controversial topic and get it across the finish line. So will there be debate? Absolutely. Will a bill cross the finish line? You know, again, never say never, but probably more likely that that'll happen in the next section. So what brought us to this point at this moment? So there are a number of factors. To start the state Supreme Court's 3 to 2 January decision that overturned the previous six-week abortion ban. And at that time, the court had one female justice, that was Kay Hearn. She had to retire because of the state's 72-year age limit. And in her place, lawmakers elected Gary Hill, which gave us an all-male Supreme Court. That court, of course, months later, upheld a six-week ban, which is now law. Another piece is the release of a convicted murderer from state prison, Gerard Price, which was a culmination uh, of a deal that was made behind closed doors between a lawyer legislator who sits on the legislature's judicial vetting committee, a solicitor, and a since-retired judge. And lastly, and I think this is important, public opinion about how judges are both vetted and elected, a responsibility, of course, that the legislature has, has turned. And ultra-conservative lawmakers have found allies in that reform effort from Democrats, solicitors, sheriffs, and even the attorney general. This week, the Judicial Merit Selection Commission, the JMSC, began a couple of weeks' worth of hearings over more than 80 judicial candidates. And they started with Justice John Kittredge, who's running unopposed for the next chief justice. Kittredge also testified in front of that special House uh, committee created by House Speaker Merle Smith to figure out what, if any, changes to the process should and can be made. Here's a bit of what he told lawmakers. Now to the, I think, self-evident part, and this is not Me, it's just simply things I've heard, and I'm confident each one of you have heard this multiple times. Allow the governor, the executive branch, to appoint members to the JMSC. Giving the executive branch a voice in the selection process will go a long way in addressing the present debate. My on what changes do you think lawmakers are seriously considering? Well, there's several ideas out there ranging from removing lawmakers completely from the process, removing a three candidate cap that JMSC has, giving the governor appointment powers, giving the governor appointment powers to the JMSC, overhauling how the state picks magistrate judges since they're just appointed and approved by the governor and the Senate, respectively. There are a lot of recommendations, suggestions, ideas. But no one is necessarily in complete uniformity about what to do quite yet. And I don't think completely removing lawmakers from the process is going to be part of it, correct? Right. And I don't hear lawmakers loving the idea of even removing themselves from the JMSC. Here's what one lawyer legislator who sits on JMSC, Lexington Republican Representative Micah Kasky, had to say. I think one of the problems in this discussion is the absence of information. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't observe that uh, consistently I hear the loudest advocates for change uh, be coming from the the individuals who can't find the time to make it to JMSC hearings, who in fact have never sat through a JMSC hearing. The process is much more extended than uh, certainly pay-for-play bloggers would have you believe, and even some elected officials would have you believe, because they skip over parts about the citizens' committees. They skip over the part about the bars, judicial qualifications committee. They skip over the part about the invasive nature of the JMSC uh, process. And Justice Kittredge also made suggestions this week that I think lawmakers could get behind, such as mid-year surveys of judges, perhaps even giving the governor an appointment or two to the JMSC But where I think there could be movement, maybe not next year, but maybe in the next legislative session, is tightening up the magistrate system. It appears the governor, who recently asked for more documentation when magistrate candidates come before him, and the House would agree to that at the very least. The Senate, on the other hand, which confirms magistrates, is another story. 
Thanks, Mayan. And if you're wondering why I didn't thank Russ right there, it's because he's not done. That's right, folks. We have another segment from Russ. Yes, this is the good stuff here, folks. I take a week off and we can fill a whole show with predominantly Russ stories. The Russ McKinney takes a look at the future of the energy industry in our growing state and the demand it fuels. Again, something that directly impacts all of us if you like having electricity. For several days around Christmas last year, South Carolina experienced record cold temperatures. The three major utilities that serve the state, Dominion, Duke, and Santee Cooper, struggled to provide enough electricity to meet customer demand. Here's Dominion Energy South Carolina President Keller Kassam at a recent state legislative hearing. On Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, particularly Christmas Eve, we had to go and have rolling blackouts on our system. All three of the utilities that are here, we failed. At that same hearing, Michael Callahan, president of Duke Energy Carolinas, delivered what he called a simple message. We need power, and we need a lot of it, and we need to take action today. Utility officials say that the anticipated growth in the state over the next 10 to 15 years could happen at a faster pace than their ability to generate the needed power. They would like to see increased pipeline capacity for natural gas and to be on the same page with the State Public Service Commission, the body which regulates them when it comes to meeting future needs. South Carolina's booming population growth and record-breaking economic development is also forcing state leaders to consider actions that will ensure the state has the capacity to meet its energy needs over the next decade. Governor McMaster has formed an interagency group of state agencies to assess needs, and House Speaker Merle Smith has created a special committee charged with drafting legislation aimed at ensuring that the state doesn't hinder additional power generation with undue utility regulation. Smith says the situation has reached a crisis point. Providing for the energy needs in South Carolina is going to be our paramount importance, not what type of generation we create. Smith and others say to ensure a reliable electric grid, the utilities must be allowed to continue to rely on a diverse mix of energy generation. According to the State Office of Regulatory Staff, electric power is generated about equally from three major sources, nuclear, coal, and natural gas. The utilities have all embraced moving toward cleaner and renewable sources for energy generation. As they move away from coal, they've turned primarily to natural gas. All three have additional gas cycle power plants in their future plans, thus their desire for more pipeline capacity across the state. John Tynan, president of the Conservation Voters of South Carolina, recently urged lawmakers to make sure the utilities don't forsake their commitments to emerging clean energy sources by relying too much on large gas power generation plants that can have lifespans lasting decades. We can be sitting in situations like we are with coal right now where you have all these utilities looking around saying we have millions if not billions of dollars of stranded assets that are on the backs of the ratepayers and we don't know what to do with them, right? And so again, being intentional and being thoughtful as we move forward rather than rushing to those mega projects, uh, let's look at what the alternatives in the market space and and, in the energy space might be. The Republican leadership in the State House of Representatives has sent a clear message to the Public Service Commission on the matter. House Speaker Smith is calling for what he calls a serious examination of the PSC. I think that they're becoming an impediment. They're becoming a little bit hostile to a new generation and to programs that are, ha- are occurring that are being presented to them. And it's time for us to take a strong look at them. All seven members of the current PSC were elected by the legislature following the costly collapse of the V.C. Summer nuclear project in 2017. At that time, many lawmakers faulted the former PSC for lax oversight. House Speaker Smith says he believes the current PSC overcorrected and may not be as receptive to the need for new power generation as policymakers would like. Now we're going to transition from the statehouse realm to another one entirely, that of Scott Morgan. (laughs) 
one of our ride or dies. That's right, Scott, who was just up in Charlotte the other day with producer Sean picking up several awards from the Radio Television Digital News Association of the Carolinas on behalf of South Carolina Public Radio. That's right, round of applause to all of our winners, all the work they do. AT. Yeah, he made me say that. Now, Scott brings us this local story out of Greenville, looking at the county's attempt to handle police calls over protesting at an abortion clinic and the First Amendment ramifications. The Greenville Women's Clinic is one of the few places in South Carolina where doctors perform abortions. That didn't change when the state Supreme Court voted to uphold legislation capping most abortions at six weeks. Neither did the presence of demonstrators. It's going to help the people come in. It's going to keep them safe. You know, it's going to cover up the hateful harassment coming over the fence when men are screaming and calling them whores and things like that. The clinic sits on Grove Road, where the posted speed limit is 35 miles an hour. Few drivers are obeying it. And the clinic has few places to park. So getting to it means walking close to traffic for three to four minutes on a grassy right-of-way without sidewalks. You shouldn't be yelling at anybody over a fence. Can you imagine how traumatic that must be for somebody, especially like a little... Demonstrators gather here almost daily to either defend or lament what the clinic stands for. Less frequent, but still common, are confrontations that can turn physical. I was assaulted right there. You know, we've got a camera right there. There's a clinic camera, um, and it doesn't really catch everything because it's just meant to catch the patients coming in and out. Um, Kiwani, and no other name given, is part of a group calling itself Clinic Defenders. At the right time when I'm out here by myself, they like to catch me, and um, I got body slammed and punched in the head several times, and then yesterday I got, or Monday I got pushed. We went flying several feet. Um, it's always angry men. <laughs> I'm not worried. I'm not scared. Across the driveway, Judy Masterson tries to steer clinic visitors across the street to the Greenville Women's Center, a crisis pregnancy center where abortions are discouraged, and where a Greenville County Sheriff's deputy sometimes parks and watches what's happening across Grove Road. I picture on TikTok. They actually posted my telephone number on TikTok. I was getting calls day and night, day and night. I had some good conversations, though. Judy and Kawani both represent the larger issues at play in these demonstrations. Morality, reproductive health care, bodily autonomy. They also embody the dilemma Greenville County officials are trying to solve. How does a government and its law enforcement and public safety infrastructure allow citizens to express their constitutional rights and keep them all safe while not infringing on the First Amendment? Yeah, that's the million-dollar question, isn't it? Rick Bradley is a member of the Greenville County Council which at first introduced but quickly backed away from drafting a law that would put curbs on protests. Our concern is somebody just getting shoved and pushed out into the road. This year so far, the Greenville County Sheriff's Office has received more than 260 calls regarding incidents at the women's clinic, many of those incidents physical, many recorded on phones, the videos posted to Facebook and TikTok. For sheriff's deputies like Scott Matheny, a lieutenant who often sits across from the clinic, these videos can be helpful evidence in an arrest, but they can also leave him with little to work with. I can tell you that all videos get reviewed by three people. They get reviewed by the investigator, they get reviewed by me, and they get reviewed by the magistrate. At the time we spoke, Matheny had brought 62 cases before a magistrate, a necessary step for getting an arrest warrant for an incident an officer doesn't witness personally. Of the 62 cases we've had out there, and we've presented every one of them to a judge, we've only been granted six arrest warrants. That disparity in cases brought versus arrests made can happen when a magistrate feels there's not enough evidence to justify an arrest warrant. It's called a quantum of proof. It's a certain amount of evidence or a certain amount of certainty that that person actually committed a crime. Seth Stoughton is a former police officer who now teaches law at the University of South Carolina. And the threshold is, would a person of what's called reasonable caution think that there was a fair likelihood that this person had committed a crime? But legal definitions and discretions don't assuage demonstrators on either side of the Greenville Women's Clinic's driveway. All the demonstrators I spoke with say they wish the sheriff's office could do more to make them feel safe from extremists who occasionally walk onto the scene and threaten them. The sheriff's office and Rick Bradley on the county council agree that anyone demonstrating anywhere in Greenville should feel safe. But Bradley worries what it might take before there's a good solution in place, now that a recently considered ordinance to set limits on demonstrations has gone back for council review. Now we're back to square one. What to do? 
I don't have an answer, but we will still be looking. The sheriff's department's trying to figure. Got to be a peaceful. If we can't make it peaceful, where do you draw the line? Are we waiting on somebody to get killed? Thanks, Scott. If you want to read these stories and more statewide news, check out SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org. We'll also be ramping up our 2024 coverage as well, which will live there and on SCETV.org slash SC2024, your home for campaign trail news coverage. Now we're out of all the realms. Welcome to the wind down section, our little break from the news, and we're glad you're here in this realm, right, A.T.? Yes, I'm glad we're in this realm. In this realm, I am a, 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 a paladin mage. I don't know. <laughs> I uh, can take any uh, form that my mind is set to. Yes, that's right. Oh, my God. Ditto head. Oh, who knows that? That's uh, a South of Spooky reference. If anyone knows that reference, please call in and love it. Yes, I am Sylvester from Looney Tunes. <laughs> anyway. That crossover. He's so talented, folks. Many re- so, uh, he, so many realms. He's he got his foot in a in. lot of realms. Realms. Anyway, speaking of realms, <laughs> the hopper is a realm in and of itself, That's Gavin. That's the truth. Are you ready for some calls? Okay, we're going to yeah. do some calls, I'm, and I'm putting an S on it because both are short. So oh. are you ready? Yeah, sure. Okay, here's That's our first. S. Sure, S. S, short. Short. Here we sure. go. Are sure. you ready? Sure. Realm. Hello, this is Amanda in Greenville, South Carolina. I am currently sitting in my car on this rainy November uh, Saturday morning and listening to the SC lead. And I just want to say that I deeply appreciated the wildly unexpected Queen Anne tangent that was in the uh, the wind-up of this episode, or wind-down, wind-down, the wind-down. I always wound up because I'm a history teacher. So the fact that, of all things, Queen Anne and the War of Spanish Succession came up during this podcast. Uh, just tickled me to no end. I feel that Queen Anne is a fascinating woman who doesn't get nearly enough credit. So having her name check filled my heart with joy on this uh, dreary November morning. Thanks, and that's all. Amanda from hashtag Yeah That Greenville. Oh. Love that. Calling on a rainy September, rainy November Saturday. November rain. Yeah. yeah. Oh, November rain. Uh, thanks for calling. And look at that support. Love that from our teachers. She probably loves realms. Maybe we need a big, well, yeah. I mean, talking big about realm, Big realm head. Empires, imperial. Um, <laughs> maybe we need that monarch podcast we've been throwing around. Mm, yeah. Uh, I'm but she's big definitely. Big into chambermaids. You know, I love <laughs> definitely, that. Definitely. Uh, Queen Anne was fascinating too. With when I was looking her up, I was like, "Oh my gosh! Like, why don't we know more about Queen Gavin Anne?" Gavin fell down an absolute monarch Allison, spiral. Yes, yeah, spiraled into. I this ate the toast wormhole. and it became very tall, and then I ate something it, else and I got small. Yeah, it was all an Alice, allegory for uh, drug ten feet use. Tall. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just spiraling over here. Uh, but thank you, yeah. uh, Queen Amanda. Amanda. Queen play, Amanda. Queen Amanda. Oh, she got a nickname. There you go, Queen Amanda. That's how you got a nickname, You got to call back, okay? You got to call back. You got to be timely. My liege. My liege. <laughs> <laughs> my lord, my liege, you have my sword. I Thousand give you, apologies. I give you my fealty. Anyway, Amanda, thank you so much. Gavin, are you ready for another call? Uh, Sire. This is the, this is what put the S in calls, okay? We're okay. going to do it right now. You know what else starts with S? What? Shire. Mm, it's... You know what? Shire. That's a real Sire. Good... Shire. Who knows? He is a sire. I think it might Can be I... Al Sire. Who knows? <laughs> Al Sire. I don't know. I'm not sure. I think that's what it came from, and we got Ellis Island on that one. You know what I mean? <laughs> anyway, Gavin, <laughs> are you ready for this next one? El Shire. There yeah, we go. That's yes in English. Okay. Hey, Gavin AT. It's been a while. It's correspondent Kevin, but I just had to call in and relay a few things. I was at All Good Books the other day for the Walter Edgar's Book Nook reveal, and I ran into the one, the only, A.T. He is a real person. He does exist. I was a little starstruck. Didn't know what to say. Probably fumbled my words. But there was a lot of powerhouse ETV people in there and met Sean, too, um, along with Alfred and Walter, of course. So I just had to say that, say hello again. It's been a while. Got through Halloween, getting ready for Turkey Day. 
and then we're going to gear up for Christmas. And yes, the Christmas tree and the lights are already up, as it should be. Y'all be good. Have a good day. Correspondent Kevin with a dispatch from Columbia here, the capital city, with a run-in with the A.T. Shire. It was so much fun to bump into Kevin. We took a picture together, and uh, it's another uh, another named caller. Love yeah, that. Yeah, this Amanda. is great. This big names up in this one. Big names. And, uh, of course, I would be the same, uh, very intimidated by you. Remember the yes. first time I met your wife? Yes. Caitlin. Caitlin, she, like, ran across the art museum here to talk with Gavin. Is that him? <laughs> I have a picture of it. She's, like, so up. It's crazy. And now she knows me. She's like, get this guy out of my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is Gavin going to stay for dinner? <laughs> huh? It, he, he just comes and drinks beer. He just takes, he takes, he takes. He He's just like takes, these cats. Thanks, thanks, these, thanks, these, these cats. cats. I love that you these have. cats. They love me, too. Anyway, uh, Kevin, <laughs> you bringing up that you have yes. the the Christmas tree, tree up the already. The lights are up. Yes, Christmas time is here. Mariah Carey has thawed out. Uh, she's She's been woken from her deep, deep slumber, and uh, she, she's she been kept next to Walt Disney's head. Mm. But um, what I want to talk about here mm. is this last episode prior to Thanksgiving right now. Mm. I think that people are lying to themselves saying that they like Thanksgiving. Uh, I think America as a country I hate this. wants to go from Halloween to immediately to Christmas. They do, but people like me say, stop right there, toots. Yeah. You're, you are going 95 and a 35, and it's a school zone. Gavin is a turkey truther. Oh, God, I love I love Thanksgiving. I just think as a people, we need to admit to ourselves that we are done with Thanksgiving. Stop it's not fun. It. It's not fun. You the, are anti-Thanksgiving food, therefore the you feel not very like good. this is this is your way of getting rid of Thanksgiving. Turkey, it's it's if it's, you're not wrong. That you're we not are wrong. Anti-Thanksgiving. Do you think how anything's podcasting? Do you know what my dad's gonna say? <laughs> my father is gonna be so <laughs> fast. I think turkey is a bad bird. Uh, it's not good casseroles like we covered last you last know, Ben episode. Franklin wanted to be the the nation's bird. Yeah. We got this boring eagle. Could instead. you imagine the Philadelphia turkeys? Oh, I wish. I mean. They kind of are, am I right? Call on 803 We're be- only best <laughs> you record guys in the get league. it, right? Oh, who knows? They're playing the Chiefs on Monday night, so who knows how oh that's going. Oh, my gosh. America is going to crumble. You're this gonna, is- you're gonna, I love that you're going to have to watch that. What do you is mean? She, I'm is gonna she going to be it? there? I don't know. Is she, gonna, is she, we're not going to name she who must not be named. Yeah, Voldemort. Taylor. I don't know. Uh, I don't. I don't keep track tabs on them. You know what I mean? I'm kind so, of over it too. I mean, I'm, I'm letting them do their thing. Like, I don't keep up with celebrity news. Like, it's just not my my thing. Some people obsess about that stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't care about these people in real life. I'm fascinated by the machinations, machinations, machinations. There you go. Yeah. Uh, machinations, machinations, the machine nations, which is a whole different podcast. Well, don't even get me started on that. Okay, machine nations, gray goo and singularities. Sometimes I pop on DailyMail.com just to see, just to have an idea of what the rest of America is thinking and talking mm, about. Mm, mm, For the most mm. part, I'm too busy reading like. All the sad news. <laughs> yeah, we love the sad for for the pod. which is why people escape and follow for the celebrity pod. news. I get that, but I think it's just terrible. Let them be. Stuff. Let them work. Let them live. As Ali Robertson would say, "God, what a wedding!" I I have seen because I've been forced to by uh, Mayon Schechter and Amy. The Machine Crouch. Nations. They make me it's know stuff about these people, and uh, so I was sent a, an update that. Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey's parents, they are meeting at the Eagles Chiefs game. And one thing I just want to point out is that they are from Pennsylvania. They're Mm. from the Philadelphia area. If they show up in Chiefs gear, then that is an absolute Benedict Arnold turncoat. Nothing, their word means nothing at that point. Games in Kansas, it's in Kansas City? It's in Kansas City. Wow. Doesn't matter. You got to wear your birds I know, gear. I know. I'm just making sure because if it was in Philadelphia, there's no doubt what would happen. If people want to keep up with it, what's the harm? I just think I'm just bored at this point. Sure. Let's get a new thing to for everyone to a talk baby. about. A baby. Maybe they get a baby. We can be like, oh, they God. Got a, the wedding, that imagine? wedding. Could you imagine the yeah. wedding? I, if they had a baby, there's no doubt in my mind this is the last thing before Gavin reads the credits. <laughs> if that baby were born, there's no doubt in my mind that it's going to be the omen. Damien level uh, baby <laughs> it, and the evil music is going to be playing every single time and baby I mean, that's, baby Kelsey I did this for you baby Kelsey I'm talking to you baby for Kelsey you. it's all for you the kid that'd be a, that'd be a lot that'd be a lot of pressure for one kid anyway Gavin yeah have a good Thanksgiving Happy okay, Thanksgiving have a, have a good I'm Thanksgiving I'm going to be up in uh, Virginia celebrating with family giving thanks and hopefully you'll be with family another and friends realm. as well another realm uh, but yes keep keep thanks and thanksgiving folks call in tell AT your favorite dish green bean casserole 
and why we need to make sure that Thanksgiving stays that little speed bump between Halloween and Christmas. And you can always thank us like Correspondent Kevin and Queen Amanda and give us a call at 803-563-7169. We love hearing from you guys. You might get a nickname. You'll probably get on the podcast. Also, you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. You can stay up to date with the latest news on SCETV.org and SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org. And don't forget to support your local newspapers. For the South Carolina lead, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina. I like that. Uh, you used all your smiles yesterday and like it's out. You're, you're dead inside now. You know how hard it is to smile. <laughs>